Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. We're at Camp Europe day one. This is the second session of the afternoon. How's everybody doing? OK, we got a little bit. Over there? Oh, is that Xavier back there? Yes? OK, cool. We got some action. I hope everybody's well and fed and coffeeed up or teed up. Uh, we got another great session in store for you. But before we talk about that and introduce our speakers, we're going to have a couple of announcements. And the first really important one that we want everyone to know is about the golf carts. And you might have already heard it in a previous session, but we really, really want you to know about the usage of golf carts. Has anyone used the golf cart to get around? One right here. So instead of having to walk across the halls, you can use the golf cart. So they're located in front of track three slash track two. They're easy to find. You could ask a volunteer or an org. Vols are in green, gray, gray tees, and orgs are in black tees, volunteers, organizers. And they will direct you if you need any help. And then the other thing we really want you to know is that the slides are available uh, for you to look at now, especially uh, for accessibility reasons. Uh, if you need any help and these are maybe a little bit too far, you could actually go to europe.wordcamp.org uh, 20, slash 2024 slash, nope, telling you this wrong one. Slides are available <laughs> on the schedule. Um, but we also want to know about feedback. Sorry, I just totally said two different things. But anyway, go to europe.wordcamp.org slash 2024 slash feedback and give feedback on all the sessions. So uh, that way we can improve all of our talks and have um, even better talks for you in the future. Or you just say, I really, really love this one. Let's do it again. Let us know. With that in mind, we're going to talk about, bring up our next session, which is Digital and Linguistic Accessibility Techniques and Strategies for Deaf People. Uh, so we have two speakers, Elena and Chiara, and we're going to just talk about those two as they come up. Um, first is Elena. <laughs> Elena, words have been at the center of the life of Elena Banchiera. Since she can remember, she got a PhD in history of the Italian language from the Instituto. <laughs> yes, I'm not going to say that part, guys. I'm, I apologize. Me dispiace. <laughs> <laughs> then she changed slides and she put her linguistic knowledge to the service of companies to help them communicate better who they are and what they do. And she became more politically and ethically aligned with intersectional transfeminism. Today, she works in the D and I field with a focus on inclusive and accessible communication. And she helps freelance professionals, com professionals companies, and nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. communicate in a kind and respectful way. She has the ambition to change the world the, one word at a time, which I love. Uh, you and I are very similar. And also, Chiara Banetta. <laughs> Thank you. Chiara is a teacher with two cochlear implants and a goal to promote accessibility and inclusion both from the student and the teacher's point of view. She graduated in classics from University of Pavia and then specialized in teaching Italian as a foreign language at uni yep, university and focused on mainly on adult literacy learners. While exploring her deaf identity, she studied Italian sign language and delved into the realm of accessibility and inclusion. She currently works in the special needs education field as a teacher, conference relator, and she focuses on promoting accessible communication, inclusive foreign language in teaching and advocating for the deaf. That was a big bio. Thanks for your patience. And Elena and Chiara, take it away. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. May we ask, sorry, may we ask the clicker? for the slides. It's here. Is it here? It's ah, is it? OK. We found it. Perfect. Free. OK. Perfect. Want, it's working. It's something. You have QR code here if you want to look at our slides in a more accessible way. Uh, this is me, but me and Elena were uh, already uh, presented, so I, I start. 
Uh, so when I speak uh, English, I am totally out of my comfort zone. Uh, English is not my first language. And since I am uh, hard of hearing, uh, I really struggled uh, learning English uh, since childhood. childhood. I, I was not born deaf, but I lost my hearing when I was uh, one year and a half. And so I usually start my conversation in English by saying sorry for my bad English. Uh, and so I say the same to you today. But point is, uh, uh, should I be sorry for my bad English, or should we all, as a society, be sorry that I struggle with English, uh, with English pronunciation, uh, with uh, understanding the spoken English, and so on? Uh, so the question for today is: the Language learning really accessible? And if not, why? Uh, as I said, I lost my hearing when I was one year and a half, and I wore a single hearing aid uh, uh, since uh, until uh, four years ago when I got two cochlear implants. And so I lived uh, different ways to hear. And I know many people who live uh, uh, with deafness uh, in many different ways. Um, uh, using sign language, uh, using different kind of uh, hearing aids, uh, and so on. And uh, um, it, for this, uh, for this, um, I I think I like to uh, to say deafness is uh, as a plural word because there is not just one way to be deaf. If we look uh, only at the ear, we uh, look at deafness only from a medical point of view. And so we have deafness uh, uh, based on uh, the entity of the hearing loss, uh, uh, the use um, of um, hearing aids, uh, and, and so on. And how do you hear? Um, how well uh, do you hear with your hearing aids? Uh, um, but here we, you have a picture of a man and only his ear. If we zoom out, we see all the face uh, of a person and the speech comes into consideration because we can ask the questions, how do you speak? Do you have a deaf accent like I have? Or you don't use your voice at all? Speech is an important part of the deaf world. Zoom out even more and we have all the upper body of a person and so hence come into play. Uh, and so people can uh, or cannot use uh, sign language as uh, a preferential language. If you notice, uh, in this picture, there is also the heart. Because what if deafness is not a disability, but uh, a matter of the heart, a matter of identity, culture, and community? So we, uh, when we consider language and identity, we really have to talk about deafness is uh, plural. And we are used to divide uh, deaf people in many different groups, as you can see in, the, in this slide. Uh, you, we often uh, make uh, two groups, um, uh, signers and non-signers. This uh, division, uh, this dichotomy is too simple because the deaf world is much more rich in the shades. And so, uh, which language do you use? Uh, your family, uh, hearing aids uh, are uh, many factors that uh, make the deaf world uh, really uh, wide in variety. I Make a list, I made a list of words to talk about deaf people, both in Italian and in English. And I noticed that there are many words, too many words. Some of them are a little old school. Some of them are considered offensive, both in Italian and in English. Other words are really used in the medical field and not in other social fields. I think that maybe we have too many words and uh, also too few because, for example, I 
Uh, in Italian, I say that I am sort of deaf, but I'm not um, always uh, happy with this definition because I can hear pretty well with my cochlear implants, but I can't say that I am hearing. So I am in, in between, um, and sometimes I feel uh, like uh, there are no words uh, to define me because wording uh, is uh, really important for people to describe themselves uh, and to, uh, for self-determination. Uh, choosing words is uh, also a political act. Uh, but sometimes uh, I also think that there are uh, um, too many words, uh, too few, but maybe we uh, should um, invent uh, new words, uh, or maybe you sh we should uh, stretch the meaning of a single word to fit uh, everybody in it. I don't know if, uh, w which is the right uh, answer, but maybe you have ideas. Mm. So I, I just said that, that deafness is plural. For, the, for this matter, um, also accessibility should be plural. Accessibility is uh, we need uh, many accessibilities because, uh, um, for example, the main uh, accessibility tool for deaf people uh, uh, is uh, the, the presence of a, a sign language interpreter. But uh, when there is, uh, it is not uh, always uh, useful because many deaf people and hard of hearing people uh, don't use the sign language. So, uh, the, the, the interpreter is important, but sometimes it can uh, be not useful. On the other hand, one may think that written test is better, is more inclusive, because it's accessible to everybody, to people who uh, know and to people who don't know sign language. However, not only, not all uh, deaf people uh, are proficient uh, in uh, understanding uh, uh, the written form of an oral language. Why? So, in this uh, picture you have uh, captions and written text. Uh, caption is uh, um, an amazing tool uh, for accessibility, but as it's a, a written form of an oral language, it isn't always accessible. Because the um, point is uh, language acquisition. Uh, we all uh, learn a language, our first language, as children. Uh, but uh, we, we learn it uh, spontaneously. Okay. I am now assuming that we are talking about deaf people who don't have other disabilities uh, or, uh, uh, and then they can see written language. Uh, because if we delve uh, into other uh, topics, I think uh, we, we will be here till tomorrow, so I'm stretching. Okay, so um, what does it mean to know a language? Grammar, vocabulary, uh, fluency, I don't know. Keep this question in mind. Acquisition is different from learning because acquisition is spontaneous and uh, unconscious. We do it uh, by living in an environment or by growing up. And uh, learning is often more conscious and guided. Hearing uh, children and uh, deaf children are different in this field because uh, Hearing children are full, uh, have a full immersion uh, in language, even, if, uh, even when they play or watch uh, anywhere else, uh, they, are, uh, uh, they can access to language input. While deaf children, uh, uh, even if they use uh, hearing aids, uh, need uh, visual, uh, uh, visual uh, input. And so lip reading, uh, sign language, of course, but also uh, written text. The problem is written text uh, isn't accessible up until a certain age. Okay. Therefore, language competence is not always accessible. It is a right that we have as citizens, but it's also a privilege. Okay, so uh, we can uh, give uh, this privilege to, to people by, in, in two ways. Um, 
One, we can work on the person, so helping uh, them learning uh, better. And uh, on the other end, we have to work, uh, we have, uh, I, we must work on the environment. So as the U UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities states, um, disability is not inside the person, but it lies in the interaction between the person and the environment. In this case, as Elena will better explain, the textual linguistic environment that can be made more accessible. In general, learning has barriers. Uh, sensory, as I just said, cognitive, physical, economic and sociocultural barriers. In Europe, we have this uh, political document uh, which is called the uh, Common European Framework for Reference for L Language Learning and Teaching, and it states that uh, knowing another language, uh, the first one, and then other language is a right and a duty. But how can we uh, get to this right uh, and how can we make uh, our duty if uh, it's not accessible? Okay, so uh, in the second part of this talk, Elena will focus more uh, on the details uh, of language and text accessibility. But I just wanted to show you in this slide uh, what can be some uh, text difficulties that, that deaf people can, uh, can meet, uh, not, not always, not all deaf people and not uh, only deaf people, but uh, these are some examples, for example, uh, general knowledge. What is general knowledge? What is a fact that everyone must know? This is not universal. It may depend from uh, where you're from, uh, your uh, level of education, and so on. Uh, vocabulary, grammar, uh, punctuation, uh, word order, so a, every language is different, has a different grammar, and many things from uh, uh, a language are uh, expressed only by the grammatical relationship between the words and not only the meaning uh, or the content of each word. I'm, I'll show you an example. Look at the two sentences. A bird flies from the house to the nest. A bird flies to his house, which is the nest. If I show you this picture, you may choose a different of the four pictures, a different one of the four pictures, if you would describe the first or the second sentence, right? But the order of the content words is the same in the two sentences. What changes is the functional words. They are empty in meaning. So for deaf people, for some of the deaf people, these meaning are often difficult to understand because these are short words, empty meaning, which uh, are all, uh, sometimes difficult to read on the lips and to hear, of course. So it's, uh, it's now Elena's turn. I, I thank you for your attention, and I give this to Elena. Thank you. So where? Uh, can we start from? We can start from a text that we already have. Uh, and in this case, we can check if the text is accessible. Otherwise, if we don't have a text um, yet, we can write it in an accessible way. And, um, but how can we um, measure uh, if a text uh, is uh, accessible, is readable, is legible, uh, is understandable. Uh, actually, um, there are some words that here I tried to summarize in this way uh, that are um, 
um, interesting because uh, they can help us to understand all the different levels uh, of a text. Um, readability, for example, is um, how easy or difficult uh, it is to read a text, and it is connected to the um, uh, to, to, to the propriety of the text in itself. Legibility is uh, in Italian is the same word actually legibilità uh, for both uh, uh, these uh, these aspects, uh, but in English we have two different words. Uh, legibility is how um, easily characters and words can be um, uh, distinguished uh, when they are written. So it's more connected to font size, uh, character spacing, contrast. It's m uh, like the graphic of, the, of a text. And uh, these two aspects uh, make us understand uh, if, a if a text is easily uh, readable or not. Uh, but there is another aspect that is uh, the comprehensibility that is um, linked to um, also to the person that is reading uh, and so um, we can um, we can say that uh, um, uh, we can understand and a, a text that is easy to understand if uh, uh, the person who is reading is able also to um, to understand all the different uh, uh, levels of meanings that that text has. Uh, it uh, involves uh, also cognitive processes. And uh, is it possible to measure how easy a text is? Is there any mathematical or uh, logical and uh, um, mm, sure way to, 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 to understand if a text is easy or not? Well, uh, during the past uh, century, actually, a lot of linguists and, um, and researchers tried to understand uh, uh, if this is possible and tried to um, invent some formulas and indexes that can help us uh, evaluate and measure the ease of reading of a text. And um, obviously, it depends on the language uh, we are talking about, because every language has rules. And uh, for example, um, here I tried to summarize uh, some different uh, formulas. Um, for example, for English, we have the flash, uh, um, Kincaid reading ease, uh, the gumming fog index, the smog index, and uh, you will have the possibility to to study these uh, these lights uh, uh, at home if you want. And uh, for Arabic, German, French, Swedish, we have a lot of uh, other formulas that sometimes are completely new, and sometimes uh, are um, some formulas that, for example, worked for. English or other languages, and they have been adapted for the, the other languages. Um, so here we have other, other languages, and uh, please, if you know other um, formulas and indexes, uh, stop me at the end of this talk and let me know, because I'm very curious, and it's not that easy to understand what kind of indexes and formulas are actually used in, um, in every country. I don't speak Russian, for example, or Arabic, so it's, uh, it's been uh, uh, quite hard to, to understand uh, um, the, the use. But well, um, all this to say that uh, um, we can have, uh, we have actually uh, some tools that can help us um, uh, understand if a text that we write is uh, easy or difficult to read. 
And these are some uh, tools that don't use uh, artificial intelligence, uh, but they only use these mathematical formulas to uh, calculate the difficulty. And the, this difficulty is uh, a combination of uh, uh, word length, uh, number of syllables, uh, number of uh, uh, words in the same sentence, so we have different uh, um, characteristics that are measured. Uh, and uh, these are uh, other tools, maybe you already know some of them. Um, uh, for example, these tools use, use um, artificial intelligence. Obviously, artificial intelligence can help us help us a lot also with uh, simplifying text and make them accessible and more uh, easily uh, readable. Uh, ChatGPT, Gemini uh, are well known, I think, in this in this room. And also, Capito is a, a smaller artificial intelligence, but very um, specific about uh, um, uh, translating. We can actually uh, speak about translating uh, text uh, from uh, a difficult, uh, uh, a high difficulty to a low difficulty. And uh, we also have Grammarly, Readable, and ProWriting Aid, and Hemingway uh, Editor, that are other uh, tools that uh, you can put your text into, and uh, at the end, uh, you can have another text easier to read. And also Yoast and SEMrush, uh, I think that the, these are the tools that you uh, know very, very well. Uh, they implemented in the past months and years um, uh, tools that uh, help you uh, make your text uh, for your blogs or uh, your pages more uh, easy and so more accessible. A disclaimer uh, from the uh, ISO uh, uh, norm. Uh, plain language uh, ensures readers can find what they need, understand it, and use it. Thus, plain language focuses on how successfully readers can use the document rather uh, than on mechanical measures such as readability formulas. This means that, yes, you can use readability formulas, that uh, they are for sure um, very useful, but you can't only rely on, on them to uh, measure and to understand if a text is uh, really accessible or not. Um, so when we write a text, where do we start from? We have to... Uh, take into consideration uh, a lot of uh, different things. Uh, who are we talking to? Where the text will be read? Uh, what is the context? And what is the goal of our text? Making existing text accessible, uh, we have two different processes that we can use. Uh, simplification is from the text to the reader. And facilitation is from the reader to the text. What does this mean? That uh, simplification, uh, with the word simplification, we uh, modify the source text, making it simpler. Uh, we change the vocabulary, we change the syntax, we change uh, or we uh, um, ban the idiom idiomatic expressions uh, and we change the in information order. With the faci facilitation, we don't change the text, we leave the text as it is, but we offer tools uh, that help to understand the text, like glossaries, uh, guiding questions, text in audio format, images and icons, formatting, we have several tools that we can use. And how simple. We also have different levels of text, textual simplification. We can uh, use the 
common classification, you know, when you're learning uh, a language that is, your no, that, that is not your first language, uh, you, you say that, you know, uh, language uh, A1 level, uh, A2 level, or B1 level. And so we can make this uh, uh, connection. A1 level, uh, we can speak about, uh, we can talk about easy language. Uh, A2, uh, easy language plus, and B1, plain language or simple language. Obviously, uh, this in English. Uh, here, as I summarized, um, uh, some expressions that you can check and uh, look for on Google, for example. Uh, in Italian, we say linguaggio chiaro. Uh, in French, in French uh, it said uh, communication claire. And so I don't speak uh, other languages, so you can, you can see and, uh, and look for um, the name of plain language in your first language. So. Okay. No. Just, um, uh, well, I work as a teacher in uh, special education. And so uh, in Italy, you know, as you know, we have uh, mixed schools. So we have people with disability attend the same uh, class uh, as uh, people without uh, disabilities. And so I, as a teacher, uh, sometimes have to uh, simplify uh, texts for them. And uh, my colleagues all sometimes think that simplifying means dumbing down and making the text more uh, poorer, more uh, simple, more uh, trivial. It's not. It's not uh, simplifying, uh, um, doesn't mean uh, dumbing down, uh, but me it means to uh, make uh, accessible so everyone can learn uh, the same thing. Thank you. So uh, in school, uh, but not only in school, uh, we all always have the goal uh, of uh, uh, teaching, so making people learn something new. So also in text, uh, we, um, we should uh, uh, be careful to make the information accessible, but also giving uh, an opportunity to learn uh, something new, to, to, to learn an, a new word, a new idea, and so on. And this, uh, this, idea, this idea was uh, um, thought first, of, I think, uh, by Stephen Krashen, a, a linguist uh, who invented this formula I, which is accessible input, plus one, plus a new item that you can uh, learn. Okay, so accessibility is also an opportunity to learn. Thank you. Thank you. And so, the practical part of this uh, um, speech, how can we write a simple text? Uh, here I will uh, uh, read actually some rules that uh, works for Italian and also for English and also for, I think, most of uh, the uh, languages that we speak. Um, we can use the typical order of sentence elements in our language. Uh, in English, uh, this typical order is a subject, verb, and object. So, this is the bad example, dinner I'll buy it, and the good example is I'll buy dinner. Okay, I only have five minutes, so I will rush a little bit. Uh, we have to write sentences of uh, maximum 25 words and give little information in each sentence. This is a bad example, I won't read it, and this is the good example you will find uh, in our slides uh, online. Uh, we uh, should prefer affirmative sentences. We should um, not use subordinate, subordinate clauses, but coordinate clauses that are um, these. These are the bad examples, and uh, the green one are the good examples, and we have to limit gerunds. We have to use verbs in the active and not passive tense. We have to prefer simple verb modes and tenses, for example, the indicative and not the, the subjunct subjunctive. 
difficult word to say. We should avoid technical words or at least explain them. We should avoid foreign words or translate them. Uh, and Chiara? Yes, yeah, really fast. Uh, I started by saying that in learning English was difficult for me, still is. And so I please ask you as a person, as a community, as citizens, not to take English for granted because knowing English isn't, uh, uh, isn't so easy for everybody. And, uh, uh, but we take it for granted because it became a uh, universal language. Um, this doesn't mean that everybody, everybody should uh, and must know it. Uh, if we want everybody to know English, we should make uh, the English learning uh, more accessible for everybody. Okay. So for deaf people, it's particularly difficult because uh, of the next slide, please. <laughs> so we'll, we'll have a laugh together. These are two memes uh, that show how English is really hard for uh, the deaf people because uh, uh, a same uh, letter can be pronounced uh, four different ways, uh, like in Pacific Ocean. Did I? Yeah. Did I? I right, think it's right. It was right. right. Okay. And uh, or the other words, I I can't even try to read them, but it's uh, okay. This is. Uh, a visual input to show you how difficult it can be, not only for the, from the, for the people, but especially for them. Okay. And I continue with uh, uh, other suggestions. Uh, we should avoid acronyms or undo them, uh, like in this example. We should prefer the verb to the derived noun. Uh, the uh, so-called nominalization. Uh, we should uh, choose between two words, uh, the most popular and well-known, which is also often one of the shortest. And uh, we have tools to choose the, the best words uh, in every languages. For example, in Italian, we have the Nuovo Vocabolario di Base, uh, and, uh, but you can find online a lot of, uh, of these kind of uh, lists of uh, common words. Uh, we should avoid idioms, proverbs, and sayings. We should avoid metaphors that are not transparent for everybody. Uh, we should also avoid irony and sarcasm. And three more suggestions. Uh, we should start from um, a structure and uh, we should put at the beginning the most important information that uh, is really important for the reader and we shouldn't forget the five uh, W plus one, so who, what, where, when, why and how. And uh, we should use formatting like bullet points, numbered lists, bold. And remember that italics uh, is used only for um, headings, underline is uh, used only for links, and uh, we should leave a lot of blank spaces. Who benefits from accessible language? Everybody. I need to short. <laughs> okay, <Everybody. yeah>. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we finished. Uh, uh, zero time, and this is uh, uh, our final sentence. Uh, you should. Yeah, the last uh, slide uh, is uh, nothing about us without us, and I am proud to be here. Uh, I'm grateful for you and uh, thankful for uh, the collaboration with my friend Elena. Okay, <laughs> thank, thank you. I, you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. I hope uh, that you understood my English <laughs> in the end. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chiara and Elena. Do we have any questions? Feel free to step up to the microphones and ask away. Looks like we got a first question. And you could queue up, too, if you like. I just uh, have to look at the caption. Sorry if I give you the shoulder. Okay. Okay, thank you. Don't apologize for your English. It's excellent. <laughs> Yes. Um, do you also do user testing? It's 
um, common practice to user test the website, also with people with a disability. Um, are there people who are deaf or hard of hearing who also participate in user testing? It's a question for both of us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, I think it's really important to test uh, for the, this <laughs> nothing uh, not be without us. But uh, in my field uh, at school, uh, yes, I, I had to test uh, and I have to make adjustment when I uh, simplify a text uh, for my students. Deaf or not deaf, it doesn't matter. I have to assess if they understood and what can I change to improve their understanding and their, uh, their learning. So, yes, I do. Uh, about uh, her field, uh, I, I leave you to answer. Yeah, well, uh, it's really important to, to test everything. It's, uh, not that easy because we know that accessibility um, is uh, very wide and so uh, we should like test uh, with a lot of different people with a lot of different uh, uh, disabilities and uh, and this is the ideal way and so it depends on on the budget it depends on uh, the aim, the goal of the text and uh, of the work, but yes, it's, uh, it's really important to involve uh, people uh, who are neurodivergent, deaf, uh, um, and um, whatever. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for your talk. I actually had a question in relation to websites and accessibility for deaf people. So uh, I was wondering, in terms of your personal opinion and experience, uh, what is the feature that is the most useful uh, on the websites that you think uh, more websites and e-commerce platforms should implement today in order for the websites to be more accessible for uh, deaf or people who have issues uh, hearing? Considering that a lot of the information is already in text, visually, because usually when we speak about accessibility, a lot of times it's for people who have visual impairments, so I wonder how that implements in terms of um, deaf people. Thank you. I go, you go. Yeah, okay. you go. No, uh, from my personal experiences, whenever a video is uh, anyway in, in implemented in the website, uh, it has to be captions, of course, so this is my exper experience. Uh, I know there are many deafblind people who will benefit from both uh, the work uh, of accessibility and uh, between the, the textual point of view, uh, I, I personally don't struggle with understanding uh, written text, uh, but uh, many, many people do uh, and uh, Actually, um, some features that are useful for blind people are also useful for deaf people, or, um, uh, for example, for how do you say um, learning disabilities uh, like uh, dyslexia, uh, modifying a test uh, to make it accessible for dyslexic people often is useful also for, uh, for deaf people because of the uh, syntax and grammar structure. Um, I think, um, I don't know, do you want to add something? Yeah, actually you should work on the text and um, on the easiness uh, uh, of, the, of the text. So mm, there are not uh, automatic tools or I don't think there are plugins, for example, to make uh, uh, a page accessible for deaf people, but you have to work uh, uh, on the design and on the text so with a good designer, UX designer, and a good copywriter who is uh, able to write in plain, plain language 
So this yes, is. I told you also that when you have a website that is not in English, for example, an Italian website, but nowadays every little button is in English because it makes cooler to. Uh, to click here, link, uh, and uh, share uh, also when the main text is in Italian, or the, um, how do you, the, 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 the links, buttons, code, buttons, buttons, then, okay, are in English, uh, and uh, this uh, confuses uh, the people uh, when uh, there is a mixture of languages, uh, I think. Uh, so uh, it's better to translate. Not accessible. Um, yeah, it's better to translate. Uh, it's better to translate. Yeah, but in Italian we don't uh, we don't do because English is uh, a big, big, has become this uh, cool uh, language, and so uh, I think maybe in Spanish uh, it's less. Uh, uh, everything is not uh, translated in English because it's cooler, but uh, in in Italy we have this mix uh, is often in the technology um, field. So in general, if you have uh, an English website, uh, it's more coherent and cohesive uh, for, for this. But uh, as uh, we said, uh, uh, complex and uh, long sentences with uh, technical uh, vocabulary can be difficult. So maybe I think uh, if you can click on a word and have uh, the, the translation or the uh, definition it's yeah. is just a little thing that you can do to help people. Yeah, with the facilitation, not only with the simplification of the text, but you can also play with uh, tools that uh, uh, help a person uh, who has a, a poor understanding of, uh, of language uh, to, to better understand glossaries and other tools. And so. Our time is up, so I was calling. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. So just a couple announcements before you guys go to the break. Uh, we really want you to take swag, so go to the information disk and get your swag. And then really, really important, I actually said the wrong time earlier, but there is a walking tour at 5.30, at 17.30. And you do meet, it's not that close, but you have to meet at Piazza Castello. And the first 13 people are free. But anybody could come. It will just cost a little bit of money. But if you want to go for free, get there. And um, there will be somebody wearing a WordCamp shirt. And that's how you will recognize it. So get swag. Go take a tour of Torino if you like. And we'll see you at the next session.